Welcome to the first session of four in our series looking at the 39 Articles of the Church of England. These videos can be watched in conjunction with the Catechesis Service video or on their own. Links to these videos and also to the videos on the Catechism and the Book of Common Prayer can be found in the description at the bottom of this video. We start our first session on the 39 Articles with a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 11. Now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared also to me, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. As we have gone through the Catechism, you may have noticed the amount of times that I reference the Articles of Religion when discussing various points of doctrine. The 39 Articles of Religion are one of the historic for formularies of the Church of England, along with the Book of Common Prayer and the ordering of bishops, priests and deacons. And we see that in Canon C15. This means that they are foundational documents for the self-understanding of the Church of England that helped it to see where it stood, especially in relation to the Roman Catholic Church and the other Protestant groupings, such as Calvinists, and Lutherans, etc. Despite this important status, the articles are little known and rarely read. So over these next few sessions, we'll have a brief overview of them. By the time of the Reformation, there was a widespread use of short statements or articles to summarise an area of teaching. These articles could be memorised and then used as a framework to explore the topic in more depth and detail. During the reign of Edward VI, Archbishop Cramner composed 42 articles of religion, which received royal assent in 1553 just before Edward's death. The reversal of the English Reformation by Mary I meant that Cramner's articles were strangled at birth. But with the accession of Elizabeth I, the Book of Common Prayer was restored and Cramner's articles were revised under the supervision of Matthew Parker, the then Archbishop of Canterbury, eventually becoming just 39 in number and being ratified by the clergy in 1571. From this time on, Clergy in the Church of England have had to subscribe or affirm their belief in the doctrines expressed in the Articles of Religion, which was made law in the 1604 Canons. Clergy in the Church of England no longer have to subscribe to the Articles, which has led some to feel free to ignore or contradict the teachings they contain. However, the Canons or Rules of the Church of England give the official position of the Articles. Canon A2 states, The 39 articles are agreeable to the word of God and may be assented unto with a good conscience by all members of the Church of England. Canon A5 states, The doctrine of the Church of England is grounded in the Holy Scriptures. In particular, such doctrine is to be found in the 39 articles of religion, the Book of Common Prayer and the Ordinal. And then clergy are asked in the Declaration of Assent, Will you affirm your loyalty to this inheritance of faith as your inspiration and guidance under God in bringing the grace and truth of Christ 
to this generation and making him known to those in your care. This means that the articles are still to be regarded as containing the doctrinal position of the Church of England. The question then arises about how to interpret the articles. In 1628, Charles I prefixed a royal declaration to the articles, which demands a literal interpretation of them. It states, No man hereafter shall either print or preach to draw the article aside any way, but shall submit to it in the plain and full meaning thereof, and shall not put his own sense or comment to be the meaning of the article, but shall take it in the literal and grammatical sense. The most famous attempt at twisting the meaning of the articles is probably John Henry Newman's Tract 90, in which he tried to show that the articles do not contradict the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, but merely teach against popular errors and exaggerations, even though he admitted that the articles were drawn up by Protestants and intended for the establishment of Protestantism. As we face discussions and disagreements about various issues in the Church of England and in the wider Anglican world, the articles of religion are becoming increasingly important as a way of defining what lies at the heart of Anglicanism and also understanding what therefore the boundaries and limits of Anglicanism are. As we look at the articles of religion, we're going to do so with a following structure where we split the articles into four groups. Articles 1 to 8 describing the Catholic faith. Articles 9 to 18 talking about personal religion. Articles 19 to 31 about corporate religion. And then 32 to 39 are miscellaneous articles. As we look at the 39 articles, we're going to use the following resources. The Articles of Religion themselves can be found in the Book of Common Prayer, but they can also be found with a modern English equivalent in the English Prayer Book. The book by Gerald Bray, The Faith We Confess, which is an exposition of the articles, and a look at the articles in their historic context by Oliver O'Donovan, entitled On the 39 Articles. And then there's also the Church Society book from 2018, Foundations of Faith, which is a reflection on each of the articles which are taken from their 2017 blog posts. The first section is the Catholic faith and where it may be found in Articles 1 to 8. So Article 1 is of faith in the Holy Trinity, Article 2 of Christ and the Son, the Son of God, Article 3 of his going down into hell, Article 4 of his resurrection, Article 5 of the Holy Ghost, Article 6 of the Sufficiency of the Scriptures, Article 7 of the Old Testament, and Article 8 of the Creeds. The articles start with five statements on the doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation. In some ways this is not a surprising place to start a Christian statement of faith. But as they were written at the height of the Reformation, we might perhaps be surprised at the restraint that Cranmer showed in not immediately launching into the controversies of the day. Instead of declaring, we are the Church of England and we are different to you because of X, Y and Z, Cramner starts by stating, we are the Church of England and we are part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church because we believe in the Trinity. In rejecting the Pope's authority and Roman Catholic doctrine, the English re reformers were clear that they were not starting a new church. This was true in two senses, doctrinally and institutionally. First, they held to the doctrines laid down in the creeds, therefore they upheld the Catholic faith, Catholic meaning universal. Looking more closely at the first five articles, we can see that they perfectly describe that orthodox Catholic faith. Secondly, one of the justifications that Henry VIII used for his split from Rome was that the Church of the English people, the Anglicana Ecclesia, existed before the Gregorian mission when Pope Gregory I sent Augustine of Canterbury to the British Isles 
in 596 AD. Therefore, the English Reformation was partly a return to the time before the church in England was under the jurisdiction of Rome. Article 6 then affirms, as we saw when we looked at the Creed, that the source of our faith is the Bible, which containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of the faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. This article brings us into the theological issues that divided the Church at the Reformation. It proclaims the sufficiency of Scripture for salvation, unlike the Roman Catholic Church, which claims that unwritten traditions or teachings passed on from the Apostles and preserved by the Church were also necessary for salvation. As the first homily from the Book of Homilies memorably puts it, let us diligently search for the well of life in the books of the New and Old Testament and not run to the stinking puddles of men's traditions devised by men's imaginations for our justification and salvation. The article then goes on to define what it means by scripture, the books of whose authority was never any doubt in the church. This excluded the apocrypha or deuterocanonical books which were included by the Roman Catholic Church, although they could be read, for example, of life and instruction of manners, but not to establish any doctrine. The ramifications of this article will be seen in later articles, but let's end with some more words from the homily on Scripture. As drink is pleasant to them that be dry, and meat to them that be hungry, so is the reading, hearing, searching and studying of Holy Scripture, to them that be desirous to know God or themselves and to do his will. There's some questions for reflection. Question one. Why is it so important to be properly Catholic in our understanding of God? Question two. It is often said that authority in the Church of England resides in scripture, tradition and reason. And sometimes experience is also added to this. Why is this inaccurate? And question three. In what ways do people these days say that scripture is insufficient? <laughs>